to be able to do, although it's only a five lecture course, which is, as I was putting the course together, not nearly enough uh, to do the universe, but we'll, we'll give it a bash, <laughs> at least give you a taste of what astronomy is like, and, uh, and, and hopefully you'll come back for more um, soon. So, because this is a five lecture course, I just wanted to give you a brief idea of what we'll be covering. The first lecture which we'll do today is really how astronomers study the universe. I don't only want to leave you with a bunch of facts that are interesting in themselves of astrophysical objects, but I'd also like people to leave with an idea of how we actually do astronomy. Um, and, and so that you have an idea of how we make the measurements and some of the techniques that we use to, to understand objects in space. Tomorrow we'll study, um, have, a, have a good look at the lives of stars, so how they form, the different kinds of stars, and how they evolve over time. And then we'll look at an interesting area that's very, um, an area of intensive research at the moment on Wednesday, which is exoplanets, planets around other stars. Then on Thursday, we'll look at galaxies and dark matter. So galaxies are really the area that I'm very interested in, um, so I'm looking forward to that. And then we'll follow up, um, we'll, we'll end off really with from the meerkat to the square kilometer array. So South Africa is the site um, of what is going to be the largest radio telescope in the world, the largest telescope in the world, in fact. And uh, so I think we couldn't, couldn't leave that out of the course. So we'll talk about radio astronomy in more detail and the Meerkat, um, which is our radio telescope and leading into the square kilometer array. If you're interested in um, reading up further, then a good introductory textbook, any first year um, introductory astronomy textbook is, it would be fine. Uh, the one that we use in my first year course usually is um, this Chasen and Macmillan Astronomy Today. Um, but this year, uh, because of the increasing burden of cost on our students, I'm actually going to be using this new OpenStax textbook, which is an open textbook, which is freely available online. You can go and download the PDF and um, read through it or print it out or, or um, any way you like. But that's a free textbook. So without waiting any longer, let's go into how do astronomers study the universe. And so I thought I'd start with one of those silly memes that go around on the internet. I'm not sure if people have seen these. Um, because people have different ideas about how astronomy is done. <laughs> I think some of my friends think I just um, fly around on planes a lot to conferences and, and telescopes. Um, my mom thinks that I'm, I'm on telescopes quite a lot. The general public often don't understand what astronomy is, and we regularly get called the Department of Astrology at UCT. <laughs> and I've had many school children ask me when I'd go to space. So um, yeah, we have, to, we have to combat those sort of misunderstandings. I think my students um, typically think I just lecture them, and that's all I do with my life, and have holidays when they do. Um, but this is sort of what I think I do. I like to study galaxies, and uh, that's, that's the stuff that gets me excited. What I really end up doing is spending a lot of time on my computer, <laughs> often banging my head and, and writing a lot of code. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the nature of work. So what astronomers really do is they study the light emitted from objects in space, and um, the point is to learn more about the universe around us and the processes that go on in space uh, so that we can understand our universe better. And there's a big continuum. Some astrophysicists like to focus on the theory end. They spend a lot of time doing calculations. Some of them never look at observations at all. While others are more interested in the observations, they go to telescopes, they take data, and they analyze it. And this is all very important. You need all sides of this to, to have a, um, the scientific method work well. You need people to take observations. You need somebody to make a theoretical model of what they mean and make predictions, which can then be tested by further observations. And uh, some people like to focus only on this end or on this end, but there are many people who, who straddle both, and um, we don't really discriminate too much. What I do think is amazing is how much we can learn about the objects in space just from the light that is emitted. We're a bit of a different physical science in that we can't make an experiment in a lab. We can't set up a nice tabletop experiment or even build a big accelerator like CERN to study what's going on in space. We have to actually build a telescope, 
observe the light, and from that light, try to understand what is going on um, with whatever object we're looking at. So really, the universe is our laboratory. Because light travels at a constant speed, it's quite useful to us. Um, <laughs> Because when we look at very distant objects, we're actually looking back in history, back over the history of the universe. It takes that light a certain amount of time to get to us. So by the time we measure that light or observe it, we're seeing the object as it was when the light left. So if an object, for example, is 100 light years away, then we're seeing it as it was 100 years ago. And this is very, very useful because it means that astronomers can study back in time by looking at more and more distant objects to understand how the universe has evolved. Um, and so we get a, a window into how the universe was in the past. So I thought I'd start with just a very, very brief um, little introduction in history and then we'll move on to more current astronomy and how we do things. So, if you look at this picture, it's just a picture of a whole lot of stars, little pinpricks of light in the sky. And I like to think of astronomy as the oldest science. Um, since the first humans were walking around on the surface of the Earth and they looked up and they wondered what those pinpricks of light were, that's when astronomy started. Um, on any, in, in a dark area um, on the Earth, if you look up, you can see about 3,000 stars with the naked eye. And Ancient humans noticed um, that certain of the stars seemed to have groupings that didn't, didn't change over time, which we call constellations, and they mapped out the stars in the sky using these, um, these patterns. They also noticed that they, um, the seven planets that passed overhead and moved across the sky, and of course the sun. And for thousands of years, this was the only way to observe the universe, was with the naked eye. And people used the stars and the constellations for navigation because they realized that some of these patterns didn't change um, with time. They didn't move across the sky, but they kept their patterns. And so they learned that they could use them to find north and south and to navigate across the sea or across the land. The stars also became important for uh, mythology and um, religion. So the ancient Babylonians are famous for inventing astrology where um, What's shown here are the, the zodiac signs, the constellations um, on the plane of the ecliptic, which is the, the path that the sun maps out in the sky over the course of the year. And they believed that um, depending on what the stars were overhead, you could predict the future. And back then, they didn't believe that every, not everyone got a horoscope made, only the king was important enough to have a horoscope made. But this became part of their culture and part of their, their religion at the time. Other peoples also used the stars for timekeeping, um, and we know this from ancient um, constructions that we see still today. The, the most famous is probably Stonehenge on the Salisbury Plain in England, um, which we think ancient people used as a kind of almanac. So at certain times of the year, um, the sun would rise over a particular stone at, at Stonehenge, and they would know that that was midsummer. And these were used possibly for um, festivals, but also possibly for planting crops and things like that. Um, this is another stone circle uh, from Egypt from about 7,000 years ago called the Nabta Playa. And um, another one in Kenya, in the Moratonga, um, which also aligns with various constellations. And so it's thought that the ancient, uh, that the, the Burana people from ancient Ethiopia used this possibly as some kind of calendar device. Um, people have used the stars also to know when to plant as part of their calendar. The ancient Egyptians would look for Sirius in the morning sky, and when they saw Sirius, they knew it was time to start planting. And people in our part of the world, the Isiklosa people, would know that it was time to start planting when they saw Isilemela, or the Pleiades constellation. And so, yeah, stars were used for, for many things, maybe not in a traditional scientific uh, sense in terms of studying what they were, but, but they were used by humans. Now, it's the ancient Greeks that we credit with trying to really understand how the um, planets and the stars all fit together in a kind of model of the universe. Um, we, we think that they were the first people to, to try and use the scientific method where you observe, you build a model, and you predict, and then you, you carry on with that cycle. And so what's shown over here 
is um, a picture of the Ptolemaic model. So it took the Greeks hundreds of years to, to get to this very complicated model of the universe where they had the Earth at the center surrounded by concentric circles where um, the planets and the sun orbited the Earth. Um, and this uh, most complicated model, um, which <laughs> was made to try to be more and more in line with the more and more complex, or well, the better and better observations people made, again with the naked eye, got quite complicated. So you had circles upon circles to explain some of the um, passages of the, of the planets that people observed in the sky. Now the problem was that the, the Greeks were um, philosophically biased. They had a thing for circles. They believed that the circle was the perfect shape and that um, the Earth had to be the center of everything. And so, you know, they couldn't easily get out of that mindset, which is why this model lasted for so long. And then it also got taken up um, by the Catholic Church. And so this model was our best model of the universe for about 1,400 years. Um, during the Dark Ages, while the Europeans were fighting many wars and uh, not much new knowledge was being gained in that part of the world, the people who really kept astronomy alive were the Islamic astronomers. And this is a picture of some Turkish astronomers. Um, and it was great that they kept things going. They developed trigonometry. <coughs> Most of the, the aim was so that um, people could figure out which, which direction Mecca was from anywhere in the world. But um, in this very old um, picture, you can still see that you know, commonly used instruments that you even find today in mathematics sets, a set square, a protractor. Um, and uh, these astronomers have left their mark on astronomy um, in terms of naming various uh, of the very bright stars in the sky that we still use these names today, like Betelgeuse, the, uh, the red star in Orion, Rigel, and Vega, and, and, and other stars as well. Their observations were also, of course, done with the naked eye. And we had to wait until the Renaissance, really, for things to start moving um, faster. So in 1514, it is thought around that year, is when Nicholas Copernicus, who was a Polish cleric, came up with the idea that, hang on a second, it would be much simpler if we put the sun in the middle of this picture because we could get rid of a whole lot of those other little circles or epicycles that were in the, in the Ptolemaic model. And so this is a, a picture of his model where the sun is now at the center, um, and then you have Mercury and Venus, and here's Earth with the moon, and Jupiter and Saturn further out. And then, of course, the, uh, the last sphere which had the, the stars stuck on <laughs> in his mind. Now, he was still also hung up on the perfect circle idea and so his model was not perfect and didn't quite match observations, but it was a huge move forward in that the, the sun was now at least at the center of uh, the, the system. Somebody else who was um, contributed a lot at that time in the Renaissance was Tycho Brahe, quite a character. He um, had an observatory on the Danish island of um, Havine, um, where he had this open air um, observatory. This is him sitting over here in this um, protractor kind of uh, measure over here. And he would make naked eye observations um, of the planets. He made very precise observations. He also observed um, supernovae, which he didn't know were supernovae at the time. And uh, it was thanks to his observations that Johannes Kepler, who came after him, um, could determine the, the proper orbits of the planets around the sun. Tycho was also quite a character. You'll see pictures of him. Um, he actually had a brass nose covering or a silver nose covering um, because when he was at university as a young man, he and another of the students decided to have a duel because they both thought that they were the best mathematician. And so they had to have a duel to figure out who was the best guy. And he lost his nose in that. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, forever after, he had to wear this little cap on his nose, um, but he was, yeah, I think he was quite a character and he um, it got to the stage where he and the Danish king had a bit of a falling out and he was forced to leave and he had to move to Prague and be the um, mathematician for the Holy Roman Empire. And it was while he was there that Johannes Kepler became his assistant. And I'll talk about Kepler in a minute. 
Somebody else who's very famous and lived around the same time, of course we can't neglect Galileo Galilei, who was an Italian physicist. And although he didn't invent the telescope, he did make his own telescope from scratch once he heard someone else had invented one. And he's credited as being the first person to actually look at astronomical objects with a telescope. So he didn't use it for, I mean, people had invented spyglasses, especially for traveling on the sea or on land, but no one had really thought to look up um, and, and look at the sun with one. So he observed Jupiter's moons for the first time. He noticed that there were little points of light, the four Galilean moons as we know them today, that moved with respect to Jupiter, and he figured out that they must be the moons and that they were orbiting around Jupiter. And this was big, because that meant that um, it wasn't only the Earth that had things in orbit around it, but that something else had, had bodies around it. Um, because at the time, Copernicus's model of um, heliocentricity had not actually been accepted broadly. He also observed the sun and saw sunspots, um, and he actually did go blind in his later life, and probably because he was looking at the sun through a telescope, so please don't do that. <laughs> uh, he observed the phases of Venus, so because Venus is interior to the Earth's orbit around the sun, it actually has phases, if you look at it. And um, he observed this with his telescope and realized that the only way you could explain this was if things were going around the sun and Venus was inside Earth's orbit. You could not get the phases of Venus right if Venus was orbiting the Earth. And then he also, of course, observed the, Earth, uh, the moon's surface and saw that it was covered in craters. So, um, <laughs> He made huge contributions to astronomy. Unfortunately, because um, of his heretical ideas of uh, heliocentricity as well, he followed Copernicus's ideas, he died under house arrest um, by the uh, Catholic Church. And he was only forgiven in the 1990s, actually. So it was quite a long uh, time. Um, at the same time, I mentioned Kepler already, but Kepler's very famous because basically what he did was he was a theoretician and a physicist more than, uh, than an observer. And he took his predecessor Tycho Brahe's observations of the, of the motions of the planets in the sky, and he managed to figure out the laws of planetary motion. He managed to figure out that actually orbits are not circular, but elliptical. And um, this was a, also an enormous leap forward because people could now move away from the, the idea of perfect circles, and, and start doing astronomy in a, in a much more scientific way. He's also credited as being the person who really connected, excuse me, astronomy with physics. Before astronomy was always sort of a bit on the edge, it had a bit of religion thrown in, it, it was a, had a bit of astrology sort of thrown in, but this was really making it much more physical and looking at bodies in a scientific way. Right, so a lot has happened since then, but I thought I'd stop when the telescope had been invented, because since then it's really was the dawn of modern astronomy. And many things, we, we've made huge progress since those days. We've discovered more planets in our solar system, like Uranus and Neptune, and we've seen all sorts of things. Um, but I can't go through everything. It'll take an entire lecture series for that. So, so I'm gonna have to stop for, for there and, and jump to the present day. We today in astronomy we, we study the universe across the electromagnetic spectrum. So we use telescopes to collect and focus light from the short wavelength, high frequency end of the electromagnetic spectrum, which are the gamma rays and X-rays, all the way through ultraviolet into the visible part of the spectrum, which is the part that we see with our eyes, down to the longer wavelength radio waves down here. And something I just want to remind, probably everybody here knows, but sometimes people get a bit mixed up. Radio waves are not sound waves, they are light waves. And so in this course, we'll talk about light and electromagnetic radiation interchangeably, okay? Radio waves are just long wavelength light, and gamma rays are just short wavelength light. And as astronomers today, we like to do multi-wavelength astronomy. We like to study things over as many wavelengths as we can, because that tells us more about the objects that we're studying. So for example, this is what the M51 or the Whirlpool Galaxy looks like in the visible part of the spectrum. If I took a picture with um, an optical telescope, this is what it would look like. So it's a beautiful big spiral galaxy. It has a companion galaxy that is probably colliding with. It has dust lanes, these dark patches that you can see in the spiral pattern 
and the blue light that you see coming from it is showing us that there are quite a lot of young stars in this galaxy. If we look at it in a different wavelength, for example, the ultraviolet, that's what the picture looks like. So the first thing you notice is that this galaxy is missing. It's not showing up really in ultraviolet, it's very faint. And what the ultraviolet is telling us is where the really young, very big hot stars are in this galaxy. And it tells us that this galaxy over here is probably not forming actively new stars. It's, it's older, its stellar population is older, but that this galaxy does have active star formation. If we go to higher wavelengths and we look at it in the X-ray part of the spectrum, you see this. The spiral pattern's gone. And that's because the X-rays are not telling us about stars. The X-rays are telling us about very energetic processes, probably um, processes where black holes are accreting matter, which is spiraling inwards, and accelerating charged particles, which will then release X-rays. And so you'll notice that it's very bright at the centers of these um, two galaxies, probably where they have supermassive black holes. So you learn about a completely different class of objects and different processes when you look in the different wavelengths. If we go to the mid-infrared, then we're learning again um, about, sorry, the near-infrared, we're learning again about young stars, uh, sorry, older stars, and the mid-infrared, sorry, I've got this the wrong way around, that's the mid-infrared, that's the near-infrared. The mid-infrared is telling us where there's dust and star formation. And finally, if we look in the radio part of the spectrum, that can tell us where the neutral gas, the neutral hydrogen is located, which is the reservoir of fuel to make new stars. And so you can learn many, many different things, all the way from what's going to be made into new young stars, right through to who's, who's around at the moment, right up to other interesting um, objects like black holes by looking at the different wavelengths of light. And so that's what we try to do today in astronomy. So I'm going to explain a little bit about how we, how we measure light so that you can get more insight into how I would know these kinds of things. So first of all, we'll just start with a wave picture, which everybody I'm sure has seen already, and talk a little bit about light. So light's weird. It's a particle and it's a wave. So you can think of it in a particle picture and in a wave picture to describe and explain certain phenomena that we observe about light. But just so that you're all clear about what I'm talking about for the rest of the lecture, I just want to define a couple of things. The wavelength is the distance between two identical points on your wave. So from crest to crest or trough to trough or this x to this x, for example. That's a wavelength. The frequency is how many of those wavelengths pass a, a given point in a second. And the velocity is just your frequency multiplied by your wavelength. And for light, or any form of electromagnetic radiation in a vacuum, the speed of light is a constant. It's 300,000 kilometers per second. Whether the light has a wavelength like that, or the light has a wavelength or frequency like that, it doesn't matter, it always travels at the speed of light. Okay. Now the frequency of light is what is fundamental about light. It tells us what kind of light it is. If we're talking about the optical part of the spectrum, the frequency is what determines the color that your eyes observe um, the light at. And the energy of the light is related to its frequency by this fundamental relation. Um, it's, it's a very simple relation where H over here is the Planck's constant. It's a fundamental constant of nature. And so the higher frequency or shorter wavelength light is the really energetic light. That's why the ultraviolet damages our skin, it interacts with our cells and breaks them down. Um, it's much more energetic light than the visible light, even though they travel at the same speed. And this is also just showing you quickly that if we take our white light and we disperse it through a prism, we can separate it into its various frequencies. This is what we would call a spectrum of light when you separate it out into its different frequencies or wavelengths, where the longer rate wavelength side is the red and the shorter wavelength side is the blue or the violet. Okay. Now, how do we learn about objects in space? 
or any object that has a particular temperature that's not zero emits electromagnetic radiation. And it emits it at a range of frequencies. In fact, all frequencies. So this is what potentially an object would, um, the spectrum of an object would look like with a particular temperature. So it doesn't just emit one kind of light, it emits many different frequencies of light. And it has this characteristic peak over here in this shape, okay? This is intensity, this is how much light is coming out, and this is the frequency. Now this is a perfect idealized radiator, this is a black body a theoretical object that absorbs all light that falls on it and then re-radiates it so it can stay at its, at its constant temperature. But many objects in space actually radiate quite closely, um, close to a, a black body. That's what the sun's um, emission looks like. I mean, this is a bit simplified, but you can see that the sun's emission overall also follows this kind of characteristic shape. It has a few b um, bumps and dips in it along the way, which we'll talk about, but it's, it's a pretty good black body. And the, the, the key thing here is that this is how you can actually learn about the temperature of an object in space. This is one way to, to find out, because depending on where this peak is, it tells you the temperature. There's a law, well, it's not really a law, it's, it's a, a formula or an equation developed by Wiens or in the late 1800s, where he realized um, that actually, if you looked at the black body spectrum, you could relate the peak wavelengths, so the wavelength at which you find this peak position, and the temperature by this very simple formula. And so if you find a black body spectrum of something, you observe it, you can get back how hot it is, or how cold it is. I quite like this picture as well, because it shows you why things glow different colors. So if I took, for example, a piece of metal, which is sitting here at room temperature at about 300 Kelvin, and I heat it up. Imagine I'm making, I imagine I'm a blacksmith or something, and I'm making a sword. And I heat up my metal in the, in the fire, and it gets hotter, reaches 1,000 Kelvin. It'll start to glow a dull red. And that's because the black body spectrum is starting to impinge on the red part of the visible spectrum. And so part of the visible wavelengths are coming in there and you're starting to see it's glowing red. As you heat it up, it's starting to peak near the, the blue part of the spectrum. And so you'll get to go from being red hot, sorry, to being blue hot to being white hot. Okay, so you will, you will, your object will change color, apparent color when you heat it up because of how its black body spectrum is moving into the visible part of the spectrum. So when you go and shower in the morning or this evening, don't get confused because cooler objects are hot and hotter objects are blue. Sorry, sorry, cooler objects are red and, and hotter objects are blue, so don't turn on the wrong tap. Okay, this is wrong. <laughs> hot, this should be blue and that should be red when we do astronomy. <laughs> okay. Now in the late 1800s, people had figured out the black body spectrum because they'd done experiments in the lab, and they knew how to make them in the lab. So they, you know, if you, if you made a hot, heated up a, a thin filament of metal, and you um, made sure that light went through a, a prism to disperse it into its spectrum, you'd get all the colors of the rainbow, depending on how hot it was, and if you measured the intensity versus the frequency, you would get a spectrum that looked like the black body spectrum. Nice uh, black body spectrum, and the peak would just, it would be in a different place depending on how hot it was, but it would always be the same shape. They also found at about the same time that if you heated up a gas and you let its light travel through a prism, you only got light being emitted at particular places in the spectrum, so only at particular frequencies, and they called these emission lines. So everywhere that it's dark here is where very little or no light is being emitted or coming through the prism. And um, in, at these particular frequencies, you're seeing light emitted. And if you were to make a plot of how much light and the, the wavelength, that's what it might look like. So it might sit on a continuous background, but then you'll have spikes at very particular frequencies or wavelengths. And at the time, physicists did not understand why that was. 
they, they knew how to make these things. You could even do some observations but you, in space and, and find these lines in the, in the spectra of stars, but you, they didn't know what they were from. You could also make what we call an absorption spectrum, where on the, the lovely um, rainbow-colored background, you have certain wavelengths or frequencies which are missing. And you could do this if you shine a hot element through a cooler gas and then through your prism, then they noticed that at certain wavelengths or frequencies, there'd be dips in the light, and they called these absorption lines. But they didn't know why. We had to wait for um, Niels Bohr to come along and explain this by explaining how the hydrogen atom's structure worked. So the hydrogen atom is a very simple atom. It only has two parts. It's got a proton in the middle, a positively charged proton, and an electron in orbit around it. And these days, we know that the electron can only be at certain particular energies. We call them energy levels in the atom. And once people understood that, they understood why emission lines and absorption lines were formed from atoms. How it works is that imagine if you have a hydrogen atom over here, here's your proton, and here's your little electron in orbit. This is a very classical picture. Of course, electron orbits are not perfectly circular and they don't really look like this, but this is a, a nice picture to, to explain it. Imagine that your, uh, your hydrogen has been excited somehow and the electron is not in its lowest energy level, but it's in a higher energy level. Then at some point, it's going to drop down to a lower energy level. And so it going, it's going to lose energy and that energy has to go somewhere and that energy is released in the form of light. With the same energy as the energy difference between the energy levels. And so you can figure out what that energy is, and we know that the energy of light is related to its frequency by the Planck constant, and so it would be released at a particular frequency. And it would always be released at the same frequency for the same energy level difference. In the same way, hydrogen would be able to absorb light if you heated it up or you, you shone light on it at particular wavelengths, at the right ones, you could excite an electron from the lowest energy state to the next energy state. And so for it to jump up, it has to take in a photon and that photon disappears. And so that's where you would get an absorption line happening if you had hydrogen gas. And so this was quite revolutionary because this allowed people to realize that um, they could learn about what elements were in space, um, in, in objects in space, and why they were um, giving off particular emission lines or absorption lines, and what temperatures they were at. So if you look at the periodic table of the elements, this is a, a lovely picture where um, it's some of the, it's the emission spectra from the different elements. And what you'll notice is that none of them are the same. Every element in the periodic table has its own unique fingerprint. You can think of it a bit like a barcode that you, you will not mix it up <laughs> with anything else. And so if you observe lines at particular positions in a spectrum, you can go and identify which elements um, are in that um, object. So this is a nice illustration of that. So this is a, a picture of a, um, the Amiga emission nebula, um, which is a big cloud of gas and dust in space. It's an emission nebula, so it's emitting, uh, it has emission lines here. This is what its intensity versus frequency spectrum looks like, quite jaggedy. But you can see the lines, and they have different strengths. This is a very strong hydrogen line. Here are some other oxygen and hydrogen lines down here. But they've identified hydrogen, helium, neon, and oxygen in this cloud by recognizing the, um, the emission lines in the spectrum. So spectroscopy is one of our vital tools for doing astronomy. This is how we learn about what objects are made of. So when somebody says that beautiful horsehead nebula contains hydrogen and helium and some highly ionized oxygen, this is how you know that. Now the last thing, um, sort of technical thing, that I want to cover because this will come up in the course as well, is just the Doppler effect. <coughs> I hope this is going to work. Let me turn up my volume on high. So everybody's heard that before. We're a moving object emitting waves <laughs> coming towards you. 
the frequency is higher, and as it passes you and goes away from you, the frequency drops. Okay, so let's, uh, we don't really need to listen to it again. Everyone's heard it, especially with police sirens or ambulance sirens as well. So what's happening there is due to the Doppler effect, which is an effect that happens to all waves, when the observer and the emitter are, are moving with respect to each other. So although your emitting object is emitting waves at a particular frequency, if you are moving either towards that object or away from that object, you will measure it to have a different frequency. And this is important um, because in space this happens a lot. Many, many objects, most objects are moving with respect to us. And so if we observe a spectrum, um, we will often observe it to be shifted in one direction or another, and then that will actually tell us what our velocity is with respect to the object um, that we are measuring. So this is um, a little picture where what's happening here is you've got observers on each side of a moving source. So at position one, the source emitted this wave. At position two, it emitted this one. Position three, it emitted that one, and position four, it emitted that one. An observer over here, in the direction where the source is moving away, it looks like to them that the wavelength is longer or the frequency is lower. To the observer on this side of the object that's moving towards it, it looks as though the waves are getting squashed together and getting shorter, and so they will observe a shortening of the, of the um, wavelength. Now, in, in astronomy, because we deal with light, we always say that the longer wavelength end is red and the shorter wavelength end is blue. So if the light is being stretched, we call it a red shift, and if the light is being squashed together, we call it a blue shift. So a blue shift, if you observe something to have a blue shift, it means it's moving towards you. If you observe something to have a red shift, it means it's moving away from you. Um, I also have quite a nice little illustration of this. If I can just get to the other tab. So this is a, um, a nice animation where you've got a source over here emitting light waves. So, and a little observer um, spaceship over here. And this is what the observer in the spaceship sees the um, frequency or wavelengths to look like. Now if I make the observer move towards the source, watch what happens over here in this box. The frequency goes higher or the wavelengths get shorter. Now imagine it moves right through it, which is nonsensical, but just pretend. Now it's moving away from the source and the wavelength appears longer. So the source is emitting at the right frequency, <laughs> but the observer is measuring it at a different one. And this is very useful in astronomy because, as I said, we can use it to measure the speed of objects in space towards us or away from us. So, for example, here is a spectrum of hydrogen at rest. So here's an, uh, an emission line and another emission line and a few more, and these are the wavelengths of those emission lines. Now, if the object was moving away from us, we would expect it to be red-shifted or blue-shifted? Red-shifted. So it's moving away from us, and so you can see all the lines are shifted to longer wavelength. This is long wavelength, that is short wavelength. So they're all shifted towards the red. If the object was moving away from us, it would appear blue-shifted, and you can see it moves to the blue end of the spectrum. Okay. But because we know the pattern of hydrogen, we know where its lines are and where they should be. <laughs> we can figure out what the shift is. We can make, you know, we, we've got laboratory measurements of the rest wavelengths of all these emission lines. And so we can do this comparison and we can find out what our measured wavelength is compared to our laboratory wavelengths and we can measure the speed. This is the relation. This velocity divided by the speed of light, we sometimes call that Z. And that Z is called the redshift. It's the redshift of the object. And so we use that a lot in galaxy um, astronomy because pretty much almost every single galaxy out there is moving away from us and has a redshift. <laughs> and so um, it's a very common term and that's why I wanted to just bring it up now. 
Okay, so what the light can tell us is the temperature of objects as we saw from black body radiation. It can tell us what the constituents of the objects are, what elements are found in them. It can tell us how fast the objects are moving towards us or away from us. It can also tell us, but I'm not going to go into a lot of detail right now, about how fast objects are rotating, whether there is turbulence in the objects, whether there are magnetic fields in the objects. If there are magnetic fields, what ha can happen is that the energy levels in the atoms can split and, and become slightly different, and so you would get slightly different electric, sorry, electronic transitions and you'd see slightly different lines. And that tells you there's a magnetic field um, in that object or around that object. So you can learn a huge amount just by observing the light coming from objects in space. Now if we go back to the um, it's uh, to, to the electromagnetic spectrum again. This is a slightly different picture. So here we've got the short wavelength, high frequency end, and the long wavelength, low frequency end. This picture over here at the bottom tells us where the atmosphere is transparent on the Earth. And it turns out that actually the Earth's atmosphere is only really transparent around the uh, optical part of the spectrum and the radio part of the spectrum. Other radiation at other wavelengths doesn't make it to the ground easily. So most of the really energetic ultraviolet luckily doesn't get through to the ground. That's good for us, otherwise we'd be fried. And thanks for the X-rays and gamma rays as well. <laughs> we don't want them. Um, and so, and, and a lot of the infrared also doesn't make it um, down to the ground, at least not at sea level. And so what we have to do if we want to observe this is we have to put telescopes in space because that's the only place we're going to pick up that radiation. So there are various reasons. For example, the infrared um, is absorbed by water vapor and oxygen, um, the ozone um, in the out, uh, up in the higher atmosphere um, absorbs the ultraviolet and X-rays and gamma rays. And so when you look at the Earth's surface, the only telescopes you'll typically find are radio telescopes, some microwave ones, optical, mini optical telescopes, and a few near infrared, because some of the infrared can make it down if you have a good sight. So just to tie up today's lecture, I'm going to give you a quick whirlwind tour through some of the telescopes we have, um, some of the big ones, and um, just to tie it back to Galileo. Things have come a long way since then. So this is just a collage. At the top is the Meerkat, um, the beginning of the Meerkat radio telescope that's being built right now in the northern Karoo. So these are some of the first dishes that are already there. This is the XMM um, uh, X-ray telescope that's in space. And this is the uh, Galax ultraviolet telescope. This is the famous Hubble. And this is the Spitzer infra near infrared telescope and mid-infrared telescope. At the bottom here, is the, the mushrooming population of telescopes at Sutherland, at the SAO in Sutherland. So um, many, many telescopes have popped up over the years. More seem to be popping up every day. So that's just showing you a little view of, of the site. Now you can think of telescopes. The telescope themselves, they collect and focus light. It's really the, um, the other things that we have to add to telescopes to do some of the other hard work. We need to add spectro spectrographs to telescopes to split the light up into the different wavelengths. And of course, we have to build really good cameras to catch the light um, that we focused in the telescope. We don't, we don't look through telescopes with our eyes anymore. So telescopes are basically light buckets. And the bigger, the better. Um, you want to catch as much light as you possibly can, so a bigger one is better than a smaller one. The other reason that you want to um, have a big telescope is that they have better resolving power. In other words, the bigger your telescope, the easier it is to distinguish two points on the sky as separate. In other words, they don't blur together. So that's also the advantage of, of very large telescopes. Now there are two sort of main designs in optical telescopes. There's a basic refractor. In a refracting telescope, the focusing element is a lens. And you see these, you know, if you go to a, a camera shop and you, and you see a short telescope there, it's typically a refractor, amateur telescope. You'll have a lens up at the um, top end. The starlight will, will come through there. It will be focused. And you'll have an eyepiece near the bottom. And so these are very typical of small telescopes. They're quite easy to make. It's quite easy to make a smallish, high-quality lens. Um, the other kind of telescope is a reflector. 
And uh, so how it works is it has a mirror at the bottom end of the telescope. The light comes down the tube, focuses, or sorry, is reflected off the primary mirror um, to a focus and then off to an eyepiece. There are various different um, secondary foci that you could have lower down, further up. You could even make a hole in your primary mirror and focus it straight back down and put detectors down there. That's called a Cassegrain focus. Typically, our scientific instruments these days are all reflecting telescopes. It is much easier, with, now that we've um, advanced in technology, to make bigger mirrors, um, which can be supported on their backs, than big lenses, which will distort quite badly in shape as you change the elevation, because gravity will pull on it differently depending on what angle it is. And it's very hard to keep a lens in shape when you can only su um, support it around the edge. Whereas a mirror at the bottom end of a telescope is much easier to support. Mm -hmm. And actually, nowadays, they even have special actuators which can um, adjust the, the tilt of the, well, can adjust the, the um, curvature of the mirror depending on where, which angle it's at so that it can keep a really sharp focus. So thanks to technology, we've made big strides in, in telescope design. Here are some of the big um, reflecting telescopes. This is um, the outside of SALT at the SAO, the Southern African Large Telescope. And that's what it looks like inside with an 11 meter mirror, 91 segments. This is another big um, step forward in large mirror design is that you don't want to grind one mirror <laughs> that's 11 meters across. It's much easier to make it up out of separate hexagonal elements which all fit together. Um, this is the VLT, or Very Large Telescope, in Chile, and it's um, made up of um, four 8.2 meter telescopes. Sometimes they um, observe separately, sometimes they actually try to combine the light from all four to do observations and really enhance the light gathering power. Other large telescopes you find on remote sites like Mauna Kea, which is the top of uh, the Hawaiian island. Um, this is the Keck telescope. It was the first telescope to have a big mirror with segmented, uh, a big segmented mirror. And then they built its partner over here, its twin, which some people call sidekick. And then uh, the Canada France Hawaii telescope is another big one, 8.1 meter Gemini, um, 8.3 meter Japanese Subaru telescope. These are all very um, large and, and excellent telescopes. The reason that you want to build these things in remote areas is obviously to get away from light pollution, but also you want to build them high up where um, the atmosphere is thinner and you have less effects of atmospheric blurring. Of course, the best is to get your telescope out in space where there's no atmosphere to mess up your observation. So this is um, a picture of good old Hubble. Also a reflecting design, but it's a Cassegrain telescope, which means that its primary mirror has, so, so at this end is where the light comes in. Here is its shutter. The light comes in, it bounces off the primary and back through the primary off the secondary over here into the instruments at the back. So this is a nice way to make quite a compact telescope, even with quite a large mirror. So um, Hubble only has a two and a half meter mirror, but it's given us some of the best images in the universe. Now if we move on to other kinds of telescopes, like radio telescopes, on the face of it they look quite different, but actually they're still reflectors and they're doing the same thing. This big um, telescope over here is the Green Bank Telescope. It's the largest steerable tele uh, radio telescope, and actually steerable telescope in the world, 105 meters diameter. So it's really hard to get a sense of scale <laughs> um, without people next to it, but they'd look like ants. And um, this is a reflector. It's, it's a special kind of reflector design where it's called a Gregorian offset. And what they've done is they've tried to move the secondary reflector out of the, the main light path of the main mirror. You can call this a mirror, but we call it a reflector usually in radio astronomy. Um, and the secondary detector, sorry, the secondary mirror will be up here um, in the detectors. So this is actually the focus, as you can see, sorry, on the diagram over here. So they've, they've just maximized the collecting area. Um, another radio telescope that's um, rather big consists of 30 45 meter antennas. This is the GMRT, or the Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope in India. And uh, you can see here that the 
reflecting um, material is not solid. It's wire, it's a mesh. And this is, this is the mirror of the telescope. And you're like, well, how does that work? As long as your reflecting surface is accurate to within a couple of wavelengths of the radiation you're catching or collecting, it's fine. So the thing is, when we're looking at radio wavelengths, we're looking at wavelengths of the order of centimeters or meters. So your surface does not have to be very precise because that long wa wavelength radiation doesn't see little problems with it. The reason that our optical telescopes need to be so precise is that we're measuring in hundreds of nanometers, which is 10 to the minus nine meters. So you need to have a very, very smooth reflecting surface, which is why your, your mirrors have to be more precisely ground. That's just me being stupid at the end. I went observing there. Um, but that shows you more the scale of these things. <laughs> Um, so this is actually an array of telescopes in India, and, and so they use all the um, telescopes to observe one object in the sky. They put all the information from those telescopes together, and um, it's called interferometry, and then you make one image of the object. Looking towards the future, it's exciting times for astronomy. There are lots of great um, facilities that are about to come online. So this is the James Webb Telescope. It's not in space yet. This is just an artist's impression, and it'll be launched next year, hopefully. Six and a half meter mirror. So this will be like Hubble on steroids. It'll be amazing. <laughs> um, another big one that's coming is the Giant Magellan Telescope, the GMT. So you can, sell us, you can see that in astronomy, we don't come up with very innovative names for our telescopes. <laughs> it's always the very large telescope, or the extremely large telescope, or the... Um, this one is going to have uh, seven 8.4 meter mirrors. So it'll be like Subaru, the Japanese telescope, times seven. And um, so it will be able to see very, very faint objects. It will be able to observe galaxies very, very far away. Um, it will also be able to observe, hopefully, exoplanets um, directly and objects in our own solar system that are too faint for our current telescopes. So it's already um, had some of its mirrors cast, and it's uh, on its way to being um, built. Another future telescope that's on hold at the moment because there's um, still some controversy about where they're going to put it. They, they had planned to put it on Mauna Kea, but some of the local um, Hawaiian people are not happy with their holy mountain site um, being used for more, um, well, I, I think you have to actually do quite a lot of clearing and, and cutting into the mountain to put this telescope there, and so they're not happy about that, and so um, there have been protests. So currently, um, they haven't decided where they're going to put it yet, but it could go to Chile. And then in South Africa, we have the meerkat that's coming. So that's one of our dishes. That is not a computer-generated picture. That's a real dish. And uh, we've got quite a few up already um, on the site in the northern Korea, just past Carnarvon. And then, of course, coming still is the SKA. So the SKA is a square kilometer array. It'll be the largest telescope on Earth. It will consist of... Um, it's a radio telescope and will consist of a, a number of different technologies. Um, we'll have what they call dense aperture arrays, sparse aperture arrays, and, and then dishes, which are the typical um, dishes that you see in the, uh, the meerkats. So the sparse aperture arrays look like this. They're dipole antennas. I promise you do science with these. <laughs> this is to look at the very low frequency radio um, waves. And then the middle part of the spectrum you would look at um, using these sparse aperture arrays. Under these covers are many antennae that they will focus using software. And then lastly, the dishes, which will be able to go to the higher frequency end of the spectrum. So that's what's coming. So stay tuned. We'll hopefully get into that on the last day of, of the, the lecture course. OK, so that's all I have to say for today. And I'm sorry that it's, I haven't left that, that much time for questions, but I'd love some questions. <laughs> so if anyone does have some. Yes? It is a light wave. I mean, what is a light wave? <laughs> That's a hard question. <laughs> it's, it's, so, 
I think the best thing to do is to, you know, when we, when we think of anything in physics, you have to think of a, um, of some kind of model that can be used to describe what you observe, um, but that maybe isn't exactly what the thing is. So for example, light, a light wave is hard to imagine because you can't see it with, you know, we can see light with our eyes, but you can see a water wave, you can picture that nicely. So I think the best way to think about it is almost that whatever light is, it behaves like a wave, but it also behaves like a particle. It does other weird things that, like, that waves can't do. They can only be described in a picture of it being a, a little packet of energy or a particle. So it's, it's hard to picture some of these things in our heads. So as humans, we try to attach it to something that we do know, <laughs> whose properties we understand, and um, that can describe what we observe, but it's hard to imagine in our heads. It's like I can't think in four-dimensional space. <laughs> My brain melts. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the best I can do. <laughs> yes. No, its frequency isn't fixed, just its velocity. So, so the velocity of the, so the frequency of the, um, the light that's being emitted, that is, yes, that, that's a certain frequency. But what we're talking about is not the, freak, not the movement of the light itself, but the movement of the object that's emitting the light. So as that object is moving away, um, it will appear to, so if, if I was emitting light to you and I was moving away from, from you, it would appear to you, it would look to you as though the light that I was emitting was, look, was red, was redder than it should be. Because it would appear to, to you as though the wavelengths were, were getting longer. It doesn't matter that, it, that light itself is traveling at a very high speed. That doesn't matter. It's just that this is an effect that happens to every kind of wave, no matter whether it's a pressure wave or a light wave. So, or, or, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. Velocity of the observer. Yes. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, okay, I see what you're saying. Yes, so you'd have to take that into account with sound. But the thing is, I suppose, that the density of the atmosphere wouldn't change that much just over the length of that road. And so it would probably be an okay approximation. <laughs> Yes, at the back. Um, with the star, it'll it'll be mainly it'll be mainly the the temperature. So when you're seeing the color of the star, you're seeing mainly the black body radiation. Um, you're not going to with your eyes, you won't you won't be seeing the individual absorption line issues. No. So it'll be mainly temperature. So if you do yes, if you see a blue star, that's typically a very hot star. If you see a, a redder star like Betelgeuse, it's a cooler star. Yes. <laughs> so that's a, um, there could be, right? So, so Andromeda and the, and the Milky Way um, are, are eventually going to bash into each other. So our nearest big, big galaxy, Andromeda. But because of the expansion of the universe, most other galaxies more distant than our local group um, of galaxies, which are, are, are sort of hang out together, they're all moving away from us. But that's really, they're, they're not really moving. It's that space is expanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. At Meerkat, do all those telescopes uh, 
focus on the same area and then share the information. Yes. So yes. One big test. So, so, so the thing with Meerkat that you'll be able to do is you'll be able to do it, yes, you'll be able to do it, set it up in various ways. So for the kind of observations I want to do, where I want to look at distant galaxies, I want all the dishes to look at the same place. And then you, you correlate the information that comes from all of them and make one signal at the end of the day. 